Very few people end up getting held accountable for their own views in this matter, as among so many others. There's an enormous amount to gain by saying something that's wrong, and there's very little to gain by saying something that's right on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just, it's just a world of suffering. Right. Where at, it, and look, the problem with this, I mean, look, this, is, this, is your, this is your area of politics more than it is mine, but these lines that are being put down on the left at the moment, of which this is one, these other ones that are now coming up, I mean, you, today's one, you can't now act a role that you're not. Scarlett Johansson, yeah. You can't pretend to be someone else. Like, this is a brand new rule. The, the, I'm talking about Scarlett Johansson, who was cast in the film as a trans... A transgender mm. woman, I think. Well, uh, a man who oh, become a woman. It might have been the other way around, but it scarcely matters. Yeah. Oh, it matters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's your uh, fascist movement. Yes, that's my privilege this. talking. <laughs> well, it's interesting because that's actually a boundary, too. That's actually a border, too. Yeah. It's, so it's yeah. another case where these things reverse in a perverse manner. But, like, where did that one come from? Yeah. It's, uh, well, it probably came from the West Coast. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, it seems to me that we need to f somehow get comfortable with the increasingly public moments of, of uncertainty on topics yeah. like this. Because so much of, so much of safety, reputational safety, as you were just alluding, is predicated in, in the public sphere in either pretending to be certain or, or falsely being certain on a safe answer a safe and wrong answer to a, a, a complicated and well, important well, question. Well, part of, part of this is, is, is um, the pathology of basal instinct. And so, because the rule now is, if I feel sorry for you, I'm good. Right, and so, so let's say there's a complex situation that requires a tremendous amount of adult cognitive computation to solve. Like, what do we do about the borders? because tearing them down is not the answer. Well, the person who stands up and says, well, I see someone who's hurt by a border and I feel empathy for them, then immediately says, therefore I'm good, which isn't so bad, but therefore I'm also morally superior to you. And this is, this is one of the true pathologies of the empathic collectivists, is that they presume that their reflexive empathy marks them out as morally superior. And that's appalling because Part of it is, A, it's too easy. Just because I feel sorry for you doesn't mean I'm good. Partly because I can feel so sorry for you that I'm actually harmful to you. And that's what happens in the case of overprotective parents, for example. So we know perfectly well that, that empathy is not an untrammeled moral virtue. It has to be tempered by other virtues, and carefully tempered by other virtues. And so we have to stop allowing in our public discourse the unquestioned assumption that just because I manifest more pity in the moment than you do, that I'm somehow a morally superior individual. Yes. In fact, not only do we have to question that, we in fact have to, we have to deeply question it and mm. say, what makes you think that you're, that you're just not taking things too far right there? Because there's right. just as much error on the side of too much empathy as there is on the side of too little empathy. And, and that's a hard thing for everyone to learn because empathy feels so good. Like if you feel mercy towards a suffering child, it's like that is kind of an indication that you're an ethical person. But there, that's not the basis for complex and sophisticated right. foreign policy. Well, is, we, we know it isn't because it... We, we know our empathy diminishes in an almost linear way with the numbers of, of people to empathize with, right? So we spoke about this one, yes, one night yes. in Vancouver, but this has been tested where if you, if you tell someone that the, about the plight of one little girl, you will elicit the maximum empathic response and the, ma the maximum of an altruistic response. They'll, they'll give the most amount of money they're going to give to any cause to one compelling story to save one little boy or girl. But if you start adding boys and girls to the, to the one, keeping the one the same, 
people's empathy degrades and their actual uh, their altruism degrades. So, so empathy is non-quantitative almost by well, definition. It's also partly because in your life, if you see a person in trouble, yes, you might be able to, to do help. something yes, about right. them. But if you see a million yeah. people in trouble, yeah. what you should probably do, at least to begin with, is run. Yeah. And I yeah. mean, what are you going to do? It, 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 you, maybe you could give $1,000 to one person, but, yeah. but if you divided that up among a million, all that would happen would you would, would, right. you would, be have, you would have no money and they wouldn't yeah. be any better off. But, but, but this is to say that so much of, of moral progress today entails unhooking from the highly salient empathy driving story and connecting with the, the actual quantitative reality to, to, to learn that it's 500,000 people dying every year from heart disease or whatever it is uh, or there's, there's, this, there's 500,000 people dying for, in this famine the fact that that, that can't be made sexy for, for our news cycle right? Mm -hmm. the fact that we lose attention well, it's something we have to figure out how to correct. Well, it's for. also akin. It's very interestingly akin to your objection that you raised before: is that um, there are there are adult forms of solving problems that aren't akin to children's play, which is something, by the way, I agree with because I don't think that the manner in which children organize the world is the end of the way that things should be organized. It's the right. basis for some of the organization. But this is akin to the same issue: is that the the basal motivational responses, the emotional responses, no matter how well-meaning, aren't of sufficient conceptual sophistication to deal with incredibly elaborate and complex systems. And then you have another problem, too, is that, well, that's really troublesome for people because they want to do the right thing globally. And then you tell them, look, you don't know anything. You don't know how to take this insanely complicated system that we have and improve it. And just because you're feeling pity doesn't mean that you're an expert in the retooling of hydroelectric systems, for example. And, and there's, one, there's one straightforward way to do that. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a brilliant Kurdish demographer who lives, who's a Swedish citizen now who cited this fact that it costs the same amount to bring one refugee and keep them in Sweden as it does to look after 100 refugees in Jordan, Turkey, or uh, Lebanon. Mm. Okay. So the obvious thing from that is you say, look, it's madness then to be, for instance, bringing in thousands of refugees to Sweden. You could be looking after hundreds of thousands of people in the region. Why is that still a tainted argument? It's because people aren't sure you're not going to smuggle in racism with mm -hmm. that. That's why. Right. I think, are you sure you're not just coming up with this demographer right. stuff a, in it's order like to... You're, it's like you're smuggling in Hitler, like yeah, the exactly. religious type smuggle in Jesus. You're going to start with NGO figures, and before we know it, it's Auschwitz. That's right, what right, they think. Right, right. But here's the thing. The, the shortcut solution to answering almost every single one of these problems is assume that your interlocutor has good motives. Yeah. Assume that they are being honest in the way that they're looking at it. 